This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Pirate Bay. Every damn click on that website is like Russian roulette. On one hand, you might get the new season of South Park completely free. On the other hand, you might lose all your credit card details. From Napster to LimeWire, with the inception of the internet grew an arms race. Around getting films, games, television completely free. This sparked a war between the entertainment industry and online pirates. With infamous pirates making millions and millions of dollars. It's a treasure chest! But ultimately having to pay a very heavy price for that. Are you stressed out about the possibility that you might end up doing a year in jail time and, and paying a lot of money? Not really. Now believe it or not, there was a time where the internet didn't exist. It would be in the 80s and the 90s where piracy would really take off. But instead of just typing in Pirate Bay into your computer, some dodgy, greasy-haired geezer called Dave would approach you at a pub. Oh, guys, wanna buy some DVDs? He would then take you to his car where you'd go and look in the boot at his terrible collection of film rip-offs. Get your DVDs, one for a fiver, three for a tenner. Are you like that, sir? It's all that last night. This era of VHS and DVD bootlegging was, again, a roll of the dice. Where you'd buy this DVD where the cover was designed in Microsoft Paint, and when you put it in your DVD player, you might not even get the film you bought. Probably it was filmed by Dave's kid on a handy cam whilst eating popcorn two centimetres away from the microphone. Nothing's wrong with any of us for that matter. But piracy was a big problem. In as early as 1981, the British Film Institute released a propaganda campaign called Home Taping is Killing Music, with this logo that was designed to look like a Jolly Roger, the pirate flag, and it was basically designed to scare people away from recording music to a cassette. No. Oh, I missed, missed the cue there, so that's that's ruined. Cassette taping was a big issue for the music industry. It was affecting how often people would actually buy real music. A taxation was introduced called the private copying levy. Basically, this was a tax on all blank recording materials, and then supposedly meant to be given back to compensate the music industry. But this led to protests by very rebellious musicians. <laughs> Malcolm McLaurin was the manager of a band called Bow Wow Wow, released his own cassette that on the B side had the ability to record onto it, leading to his record label EMI dropping in very quickly. The Dead Kennedys went on to do the same thing by releasing a blank B side to record your own music to. This was kind of in the very politically motivated punk era, where they basically hated on the capitalist fat cat kind of stereotype. Hey. Funnily enough though, this tax didn't end up doing what it aimed to do, which was to target the piracy industry, but ended up mainly affecting digital software companies who use blank CDs to make software with. Good old taxation. But anyway, into the 90s. DVD piracy was becoming more and more of an issue, and it went from Dave making a few quid for beer money on the weekend into a booming illegal multinational industry, making millions and millions of dollars. In the year 2000s, the Hong Kong Customs seized 1.53 million pirated discs. As well, a number of people were arrested for making millions and millions off of pirating DVDs. One being this seven million dollar operation that literally used Chinese immigrants as slaves to make these DVDs. This was becoming a serious issue. The internet opened a whole new era of piracy. Dave was now out of work because he didn't know how to turn on a computer, and things were changing. Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring. Squarespace is the number one platform for building and developing your own website. It's more important than ever having a good looking website these days. No matter what you do and how good you are at it, if your website looks terrible, people just won't trust you. Squarespace makes building a website easy and very quick. By having tons of templates for you to choose from, you can pick whatever it is you like, customize it perfect to fit what you do, and next thing you know, you'll have a professional looking website. As well, there's tons of tools built into Squarespace, like e-commerce, email marketing, members only content and I've been using it myself it's very simple and user friendly so be sure to check out Squarespace at www.squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain use the code Jimmy the Giant anyway back to the video by the 90s to the 2000s the internet was this new wave of technology it was revolutionizing the world and one of the main drivers for that innovation was well the 
very similar to how the widely loved drink of Coca-Cola was originally invented because of cocaine, the acceleration of the internet was largely driven by man's desire to see a pair of hoo hearts The adult business fueled a lot of the growth of technology that exists on the internet. Things like image hosting, video hosting, as well as online advertising, online payment systems. The adult industry was spearheading the internet. And so with this new internet gold rush, the pirates arrived on the digital shores with new techniques in the wild seas that was the early internet. Napster, the song swapping company is now now in the top 50 list of most visited sites on the web. In 1999, the infamous website Napster was founded by Sean Parker and Sean Fanning, who we will refer to as the Naughty Shawns. The Naughty Shawns set out to create a platform where someone can just share the music that they like the most. This came about as a direct reaction to how cumbersome it had become to find music. 1999 was an all-time high for music purchasing, and in large part that was because it was very hard to get a hold of music. The ways that you would find new music would be by listening to the radio or one of your friends would recommend it. You'd then have to get in a car and travel all the way to a record shop, look for all the records, find the one that you want, which might cost 15 bucks. It has 20 odd songs on there that you don't really care about any of them other than the one you want to listen to. This became very expensive and very annoying for music lovers. Within just a few months of Napster launching, it absolutely blew up getting tens of millions of users. But very quickly, they started to run into some problems. Napster hijacked our music without asking. They never sought our permission. Our catalog of music simply became available for free downloads on the Napster system. Lars Ulrich was in the very well-known band Metallica, who decided to go to war against Napster. And on the 13th of April 2000, they filed a lawsuit. Every time a Napster enthusiast downloads a song, it takes money from the pockets of all these members of the creative community. This was the first of its kind. They even made this strange anti-piracy video in a hopes to scare young kids away from pirating their music. Maybe I wouldn't have to whore myself out if you kids didn't steal my music. Uh, whoa. <laughs> We're not stealing, okay? We're just sharing with each other, you know? To which Napster founder Sean Fanning appeared at an MTV Awards event wearing a Metallica shirt as a direct diss. Nice shirt. Nice shirt. You like it? You like it? Yeah. This whole situation was hilarious and South Park even commented on the absurdity of it. This is the home of Lars Ulrich, the drummer from Metallica. What's the matter with him? This month he was hoping to have a gold-plated Shark Tank bar installed right next to the pool. But thanks to people downloading his music for free, he must now wait a few months before he can afford it. But you see big labels such as Sony, Universal, Warner, as well as artists like Dr. Dre, Britney Spears, all followed suit. Instead of trying to understand the technology and the reasons for piracy, they doubled down and went to war hoping to be able to eliminate peer-to-peer -peer software. With the insane belief that people would come back to their senses and trust in good old fashioned CDs. They were even going after specific individuals who pirated software. But the Naughty Shawns had become infamous. They were appearing in magazines. They were these anti-establishment figures, but in 2001, all would come crashing down when Napster was forced to shut down. A federal court ruled Monday, Napster must stop allowing music fans to swap copyrighted material. This was a small win for the music industry, but ultimately, the genie was out the bottle. As the internet continued to grow, so too did the world of piracy. You'd have new peer-to-peer -peer platforms such as LimeWire, Morpheus, BearShare, Kazaa, and then you'd have torrent sites popping up. You get famous websites like Pirate Bay offering much higher quality videos, and then Mega Upload emerged. The music, film, entertainment industry was suffering massive losses, and it was claimed that piracy was costing the US economy 12.5 billion annually. And so the fat cats aboard the SS entertainment industry were in panic mode as the pirates were circling around them. These lawsuits targeting piracy on the individual level, as well as these campaigns like you wouldn't steal a car. They sought to scare off and combat piracy, but the damage was already done and it was too late. And so you may be there wondering what was in it for the pirates? Like what was incentivizing them? Money. 
Pirates can make a good amount of money. Advertising is a major source of income for these industries. They're not gonna use Google Ads, they'll use some kind of high-risk ad network who don't really care about using slightly dodgy websites. But as well, some of these platforms would offer private subscriptions, where they would guarantee faster download speeds and access to exclusive content in exchange for a monthly fee. And as well, many of these downloads were absolutely riddled in viruses. So whilst pirates aren't really shouting about how much money they make, it's fair to say they can make a lot of money and many have made millions. But as piracy continued to grow, governments would be forced to take action. Laws like DMCA in America were enacted to combat piracy. A DMCA strike could carry jail time and a felony charge. If you played copyrighted material, even snippets and by accident, you run the risk of a felony charge and potential jail time for it. High profile piracy cases emerged, such as the arrest of the Pirate Bay founders, who were sentenced to spending four months to one year in prison and having to pay millions in damages. Kim.com was the founder of Mega Upload, who reportedly had a net worth of $200 million. But after his legal troubles, his net worth shrunk considerably. They didn't just come to my place and seize my cars, they closed my bank accounts and all of that. They also sent a SWAT team to my mother in Germany and took her car. They were trying to kill it off and they were still just pushing DVDs. Oh look, we got Blu-ray now. We can even deliver them to your front door. Dude, no one cares. I just downloaded the entire series of 24 for free. And I didn't get a single virus due to my pirated version of McAfee. But then finally, one man would come along who could see the future and knew what was needed to be done to save the entertainment industry. And that man was Steve Jobs. And we're optimists. We're, we're, we believe that 80% of the people stealing music don't really want to steal music. We think they'd rather be legal if somebody offered them a competitive, compelling way to be legal. As an engineer himself, he saw these pirates not as just thieves, but as people who were actually innovating technology. They were a solution and not a problem. And so in 2003, Apple would release iTunes, a fully legal online store where you could browse and purchase music from every different artist and buy singles for just 99 cents. By the end of the first year, they had sold 70 million singles. Now for the entertainment industry, the profit margins were significantly lower than CDs, but the entertainment industry had realized that they needed to evolve with the times. The good old days were over and they can't keep fighting against the current. And so as time passed, in response to the piracy epidemic, legitimate streaming platforms such as iTunes, but then Spotify and Netflix would emerge. And piracy has decreased somewhat over time, but in 2023, it is still alive and well. The landscape has changed, but there is reports that piracy is on the rise again. And it seems to be for the same reason that it began in the first place. Just think about it, how many times have you wanted to watch a movie? You excitedly type it into Netflix and it's not there. So you now go onto Google, you try and search what platform is it on and of course, it happens to be on the one platform that you don't own, and so you have to pay for yet another streaming service. And so right now, pirates are addressing that issue with these things called illegal Cody boxes. Pirates right now are getting better at becoming more decentralized, more anonymous, finding different ways of making money, and are still a thorn in the heel of the entertainment industry. So tell me what you think about piracy. Do you think it's ever gonna go away? Or do you think it's a needed tool to progress technology? If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel and watch this video right here.